And welcome everyone. We are back for Tuesdays at two with the Metro Chamber and the Sacramento Bee. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our CEO, Amanda Blackwood. Thank you, Erica, and welcome everybody to today's episode. Uh, I am Amanda Blackwood, President and CEO of the Sacramento Metro Chamber of Commerce. We are the regional chamber of commerce representing all 22 cities and six counties of the Sacramento region. A huge thank you as always to the Sacramento Bee for creating this space for us. Uh, Tuesdays at two, our chance to get into the things that are most top of mind for our community. Uh, as a reminder, you do have the opportunity to ask live questions during today's show. If you're following on the SACB Facebook page, just enter those questions into the box. We'll have about a 25 minute conversation in the last five minutes of our episode today. We will get to those live questions. Uh, as always, we will also put this information at the end of the program. So anything that we talk about today, you'll get links, you'll get websites. Please don't try to write them down while you're driving in the car. Uh, we will get you at the end of the show. So with that, I could not be more thrilled uh, to present two of my very favorite people, uh, Cassandra Jennings, the uh, president of the Greater Sacramento Urban League, and Roy Kim, the deputy director of workforce development for the Sacramento Employment and Training Agency and Sacramento Works, otherwise known as SETA. Welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you. So I think I'll dive in a little bit with you. I have the honor of, of working with you both and knowing you both, but maybe some of our viewers don't. Could you give us a little bit about your organization, uh, what you do and how folks might engage? Cassandra, we'll, we'll give it to you first. Okay, great, great. Although I'd certainly um, like to participate with uh, Roy um, and Seta because they're a great partner with us and they actually fund uh, one of our programs. But the Urban League, our mission is really to help African Americans and people in underserved communities to achieve economic self-reliance. And we do that through basically three pillows, um, educate, empower, and employ. And uh, we are a job center here, one of America's job centers here with full service, wraparound services to help um, job seekers get prepared and then connect with employers and then get hired. And then we have a number of programs that represent education and training programs and hiring events that will all just be wraparound services to get people to success. And in addition, we, we uh, support those by having housing counseling, uh, by doing support services, by working with family services and part of the Black Child Legacy, and just a number of services that meet the community where they are and take them to the next place. And, you know, economic self-reliance is really about just taking care of yourselves and taking care of your families and then being able to... Um, to make that dream come true. So it might be taking care of my family now, but preparing to even do better at that in the future. So we've been around 52 years. Uh, we work with populations that are oftentimes left behind, uh, don't have access. And so we do a lot of work to make sure that there's equity and access to the opportunities um, in our communities. Very good. Yeah, um, I was going to say it at the beginning, I was waiting there. I was going to say age before beauty, but I think either way I lose. So <laughs> Cassandra gets to go first. Um, but uh, for those that aren't familiar with the Sacramento Employment and Training Agency, or SETA is the acronym that, that uh, we're most commonly referred to, we're essentially what's called the Joint Powers Authority between the city of Sacramento and the county of Sacramento. And basically what that means is the city and the county have designated SETA to be the grant administrator, if you will, of a number of different federal programs. Um, the, the, the major programs we oversee, the largest one um, in terms of dollars is uh, the Head Start program, where we operate uh, the, the countywide uh, Head Start program that serves uh, zero up to five years old. The programs, I don't know, I, that, that program isn't under my charge, but I oversee the Workforce Development Department and the major programs in that department are the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act cluster, which funds the job center network. We have 14 job centers, one of which is the Urban League, uh, just up the street from our headquarters. And we also fund a number of subcontracted uh, programs for disadvantaged youth, which also includes the Urban League. And then our other major programs we have is a refugee resettlement program, which provides employment 
and training uh, in partnership with the County of Sacramento for newly arriving refugees from all over the world. And the, the final major program we have is called the Community Services Block Grant Program, which funds a lot of uh, safety net or emergency type uh, services for people who are really in need. And we have RFP actually, I believe it's out on the street as we speak, um, that's soliciting proposals uh, under our CSPG CARES Act fund. So wanted to let people know about that. Our website's www.seta.net. If you've never been there, I'd encourage you to, uh, to go there if you're, if you're interested in any of the programs or resources we have. And, um, and almost uh, pretty much all of our programs are heavily invested in really targeting underserved neighborhoods, hard to serve uh, different groups of hard to serve populations. And so we're very heavily invested in that space. So obviously both of you champions in the workforce space, champions in preparing folks for, you know, the jobs of now and the jobs of the future, you know, over the last few years, I think we've had this ongoing dialogue about digital skills, right? The need for digital skills, the demand for digital skills in this current COVID moment, we also have, you know, a larger group of folks that find themselves unemployed. Perhaps they came from retail hospitality, um, you know, and that, that demand is, that demand is high. So could you talk a little bit about where, where your organizations have taken the leadership role in that digital advanced work, um, you know, the skill set that folks are really looking for in the future, as well as, as reskilling these folks that are finding themselves currently in a situation they probably were not expecting. Yeah, well, at the Urban League, we have had for uh, quite a bit of time, we had a, a, a digital A plus, um, IT A plus program that was pretty robust. And then we transitioned into a digital literacy program and really required everybody or encouraged everybody who came through our center to take advantage of it. You know, brush up on your skills, uh, you know, whatever kind of job you're gonna get or wherever you are, you're gonna need some of those skills. COVID and has really said, we were just playing around the fringes there. And it has really, accelerated what we are doing. And I know just in general, the reports say that um, the COVID has taken us almost 20 years ahead in this whole digital system. So we really advanced uh, not only internally as to what we do to operate, but we've advanced in what we now offer to the community for that, because we know how important it is. So not only do we have our digital literacy, because that's a start, uh, we are now working with numerous partners to really do reskilling, upskilling, and skilling around the IT world. So because not only is it important to survive and thrive and it's gonna be the work of the future, it's those jobs of the now and the future too. So we're partnering with um, GSAC to do, and General Assembly to do some upskilling, to do some IT engineering. And then we have this collective six that we are also working with that's really looking at digital, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's um, um, the, the arts and animation or STEM to really prepare people in this whole new technology age. And I shouldn't say new advanced um, technology, which we find ourselves in. And then the last thing I'll say is because the digital world is just so, um, necessary now that we know because of COVID that a lot of people are not going to have access to what they used to having to make it. So we are developing what we call a dark space. And it's not dark because it's dark. It's Digital Assistance Resource Center, where people will be able to come and be COVID compliant and be able to access technology and have a skilled person to assist them in really in this so digital environment. So that's a way that it can still be hands-on in person, uh, obviously in COVID compliant, but support this whole digital world that we're in now. Yeah, for and, yeah Roy, same question to you. I know that, that you partner on this work and have other work in this space as well. Sure, for SETA, I'll mention a few things. So I, get, I talked about the Job Center Network and you know, for the most part, all of our job centers are still open to the public to one degree or another. Um, all like 10 of them are actually open by appointment. And so 
And those those job centers do have uh, computer resources and staff assistance for people who need them. Um, SET, has, SET has invested over the last few years in a number of really what we call uh, kind of under the umbrella of future to work. Uh, we've invested in a number of different research projects and you'll, you'll have seen different reports come out from an organization called Valley Vision on that uh, around that effort. And Valley Vision's also, um, we've engaged them to do different industry sector convenings along with the community college system. And that research is being embedded in those different convenings and, and our, our goal is, or our hope is to, that that can help drive decisions on curriculum policy and other uh, types of resource investments around digital literacy. And it, should, and it, and it appears to be uh, actually doing just that. But some specific products, I think I, I wanna make sure that, that people are aware of. And, and one, of, one of them is specifically, uh, we invested in this prior to COVID, but we saw a dramatic increase in the usage as a result of COVID. And that's what, what I call the metrics. It's an online uh, learning platform and it's available free of cost to any user in Sacramento County. It's located on our sacramentoworks.org website. It's got a prominent, it's the second link if you go there and you can sign up uh, from the comfort of your house or anywhere you have internet access and a computing device. Uh, there's over 5,000 training courses and many of them are in digital literacy, but, but just as important, I think, digital literacy to me is, is, is one of those foundational areas, just like math and reading and other soft skills that people need um, to really succeed in today's workplace. And digital literacy is part of that package. And I think so um, that's why I encourage people um, to use metrics. The other thing we've been doing since COVID started is actually giving our customers or purchasing our customers uh, laptop computing devices so they can actually uh, conduct job search or participate in employment activities uh, while they're in while they're via Zoom or or in remote sessions. So I think um, those are a couple specific things um, I, I'd like to share. Great. Well, I know both of your organizations and some of this together, you have pivoted quickly to meet this COVID need. Right. And with the influx of CARES dollars, which are finite, you know, in use and have to be out the door by the end of the year, are you know, both working actively with the city of Sacramento to get some of that programmatic work launched. So I know, you know, contracts still in play, maybe some T's to be crossed and I's to be dotted. Uh, but could you share with our audience today what's kind of coming down the pipeline there uh, that's maybe in the short term and where they could go to get some more information on that? Right. So there are going to be hundreds of opportunities available actually right now that are going to provide reskilling, upskilling, and, and just skilling for those who have been affected by COVID in the city of Sacramento. So the first thing I should say is look now, certainly at the Urban League, uh, go to our website, gsul.org, or call us still, because we are open for business at 916-286-8600. But just to give you an idea of what some of the programs out there is that people are going to have the opportunity to get training in both skills, um, uh, IT skills, as well as we're looking at advanced manufacturing. Uh, there will be stipends for people, many different forms that while they are doing the training, and then there will be internships and paid internships in some of the programs, as well as um, um, paid time on the job in order for, and then placements on the job. So, and as Roy mentioned that some of the programs will provide all the equipment, if you need a computer, all you need to do is really understand that maybe you have to pivot or maybe you want to um, um, take another career path or get really trained and skilled in an area that there's a pathway for you that is gonna be supported all the way. So we have programs again that include um, of six weeks of training in IT with jobs at the end. We have uh, animation and cybersecurity and, and programs for youth as well, 16 to 24 or adults 18 on up 
where you can really get the skills that you need. And it's going to be fast and furious and people don't want to miss that opportunity. So call us and we will connect you to the right program. So Roy, a question I have for you, it's a kind of a slight pivot, right? We were hearing about the industries that are facing loss, right? And, and you have those people coming your way, but there are also industries that are hiring, right? And SETA is also an amazing resource for a group of people with skills that have gone through these trainings uh, that employers could reach out and, and maybe start to make some of those connections. Could you tell us a little bit about where you've seen some success there and how maybe some employers that are listening today can reach out and, and maybe find some really qualified folks. Sure. Uh, again, I mean, it, I've, I've done several of these webinars and, and I, I, at every single one of them, I've emphasized, yes, we're open for business, both job seekers as well as employers. Even though we've seen a, a dramatic downturn, right, and, and, and thousands of layoffs, I think there are still sectors that are hiring. Uh, some of the specific sectors that come to mind uh, Public sector continues to hire anything in the distribution area, retail distribution, retail delivery, those areas, they can't get enough workers. I think in no secret, everyone's heard the news, oh, Amazon's hiring 100,000 people. You know, that, that's true. So, and it isn't just Amazon, it's anyone else who's uh, kind of competing or not competing even in, in that space. So, and healthcare continues to hire and, and there are other sectors. We. SETA sees hundreds of job postings that come through here uh, on a monthly basis. And so our role is to both help job seekers connect with employment, help businesses who are looking at uh, recruiting and hiring. And, and so we do both. And so we, wanna, we have a business services unit and we'd be happy to work with any business to help them meet their hiring needs, especially those businesses that really wanna connect with some of the, the more diverse communities that, that we're serving. And I think um, when regards to the city funds, I mean, our we, we've been recommended for the city funding to do specifically on the job training program. And so we're, we're in the process of, um, of implementing that and, and um, we don't know all the parameters around that, but, but we're, we're happy to do that. Even without that, so it's got two or three other dozen different programs that come and go. It's like a constant revolving door as programs come and go, they leave. The, the point I think I can't emphasize enough is, you know, all of our contact information's on our website and we have phone numbers there as well. And we encourage you to, to connect with us, um, both job seeker side and employer side, because the city money is, is gonna be here and gone by the end of the year, but there'll be other programs that, that we have and the job center network content will continue. And that's kind of our, our uh, go-to place for accessing services. Yeah, and if I could say, I, I know SETA is the constant. So uh, while the others will fluctuate, SETA is the stabilizing force. So we appreciate their, their partnership. And I would say, as we work with employers, in fact, we have a job fair that's going on, a hiring event that's going on downstairs in our building right now, uh, where people are coming in. Many have made appointments because it is um, COVID compliant, but they are being interviewed and offered jobs um, if they're successful, and many are uh, right now. We've also had hiring events virtually as well as in present uh, with FedEx and other corporations and other uh, CVS and others that are looking for people now to come to work. So um, uh, we work with employers too, and I know the other job centers do as well, uh, to really make sure that the access is not only available uh, online, but we do outreach and we want to make sure that they are able, that people from under-resourced communities are also able to, to take advantage of those jobs. You know, Cassandra, you use the phrase a stabilizing force, and for so many, the Urban League is that stabilizing force, particularly for youth. So while you have a robust, you know, workforce and placement program, you also have very robust youth programs and I know more, more than ever, right? You've got teenagers at home, you've got parents trying to cope, you got remote learning, kids not being able to connect with their peers and friends and they're really needing that connection. Could you tell a little bit and maybe give some hope to the parents that are watching today 
uh, about the youth programming and the work that the Urban League does and how folks might uh, be able to find them themselves a place there. Great, yes, and the youth are so important because not only are their future, they have a great role right now um, in where we are. And at three of our programs, I'll give an example, come to mind. One is our Project Next Level, and that is the one that's funded through SETA, where we work with out-of-school youth to really help them on the pathway to success. So if they need to finish high school or there's time for more education in college or community college, and then how do they really connect to meaningful employment and deal with all the other things that happens not only to adults, but to youth as well, uh, which is called life. So we, we call it Project Next Level because we are preparing them for the next level and the next opportunity in their life. So we have availability for that. We have case management. We do a lot of sort of creative things, not only about yourself and your and, and being able to describe yourself, but then we prepare you with your resume, with um, interviewing skills and all of that, uh, and encourage you to do something that is meaningful to you that will help with your growth. But, the, and the other programs are sort of just supportive of that and then take all the rest. So we do work with youth in school as well because in our um, YES program and then our pop-ups. And we're creative with that. We're creative on the Zoom, on the Facebook Live, and we gather them together. They are able to do projects together. And so um, it could be as extensive It come together. How can I help with my community? They decide what they want to do. It's sort of like a social justice kind of thing. And then meanwhile, we're giving them the skills to be leaders, to um, develop what they think is important and then to follow their dreams. Um, and the, some of the pop-ups include like scavenger hunts in the house or sometimes we do cooking exercises, which means we will deliver the cooking um, ingredients to their house and then we'll all get on and, and do something exciting. So it, it's that kind of um, support or extracurricular things that we used to take for granted for a minute. Now we're having to do it on Zoom and to be a little more creative. And I will say one opportunity we did get to do face to face and this last round for the summer and we look forward to the fall is because it was a time where we were able to engage the youth in census work and to get out the vote and car vans and drop things off. So it's all that sort of social, civic, community involvement. And then the other um, uh, great one was, let's say, not only the, um, the, the youth, oh, but they were, they were also able, oh my goodness, census. Oh, and the food delivery. So we deliver food and PPE every Friday in Oak Park and we were able to youth were able to do a project very safely to help prepare the boxes for us to deliver to food to needy families. So while it's activities that hopefully they're having fun and interacting with other people their age, they're also doing something important and giving back to the community. So I think my final question I'll ask for today and then we'll turn it over to audience questions are, um, I, and you, you both deeply know this, you know, we knew before the protests and before, you know, we've had kind of heightened awareness that the issues of implicit bias exist within our hiring practices. We know that the issues of racism exist in hiring practices and that unfortunately it is often those things that are the barrier, you know, to opportunity for people who are incredible, you know, members of this community who are doing incredible work, who are incredible leaders and you know, the, the existence of racism is real. So could you describe a little bit about from your perspective, you know, what, what do you think needs to change and what are your organizations doing to catalyze that change? And maybe one little nugget that, you know, somebody that's listening today may rethink, you know, how they're approaching, how they're looking at their workforce, how they're engaging with their workforce, how they're hiring uh, based on your words of wisdom today. I'll let Roy, I've been talking. Roy, you want to go first? <laughs> that's, that's fine, Cassandra. <laughs> I, I, I know my place, that's all. Um, so so um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think uh, for, from SETA's perspective, so for those that work with SETA, uh, 
I, I don't, uh, not sure how to say this, so I'll just say this. SETA has a philosophy of really targeting its resources into underserved areas and underserved communities. And I think it's one of the strengths of the Title system, Title I system. If you look at our RFPs and how we invest our resources, I think it, it will bear that out. We, uh, we definitely fund a, a number, a, a large number of the community-based organizations, and, and we believe heavily you know, I, I often say set is first a funder of services and second a provider of services. And, and part of that is, is because we believe strongly in investing dollars in communities where those resources can best be utilized. And so that's, that's an intentional strategy and, and it's intentional that our job centers are neighborhood based and they're relatively small compared to other local areas throughout California and the nation. Um, so, and there's, there, there are good reasons for that. We believe that there are stronger ties to serve the residents and the citizens in those communities. So, so I mean, from, from, you know, we can always do it better, but I think the Title I, which is, we owe a Title I set a funded job center network, I think one of its strength is really engaging those areas. And, and I think you know, SETA, SETA and the Title I SETA is just one of many, many funding silos um, that, that, you know, and, and you know, one of the things, I think there are other funding silos that partner with us that are equally invested in those communities, but the more you target resources into those neighborhoods, into those communities, and intentionally, intentionally try to serve the, the hardest to serve members of those communities, the more you can um, try and level that playing field. And, and I think, it, you know, in my opinion, that's, that's part of, that's one piece of the puzzle and, and, and we need to see more of that. Yeah, and I think Roy hit on the, the word that I always use is intentionality. And if we're gonna address the social and racial injustice that and unrest that we have in this country, we have to be intentional about our actions if we're gonna see some change. And so for the Urban League, this really just sort of puts an exclamation point behind what we have been fighting for for 52 years in Sacramento and 110 years throughout this nation as a national movement. And at this time, what I see and where the opportunity will be is one through diversity and inclusion. And so if you're an employer, you need to have a diversity and inclusion uh, policy that you, you plan to implement, you know, just not to put on the shelf. So that's where the intentionality comes. I think, and you see um, the city and others trying to look at it, that you definitely need to have a racial, and I'm just going to add gender equity lens on the things. Because if you're going to be intentional and you're going to be inclusive, then you need to be looking at and monitoring and managing what it is that you're doing. And, and I think most companies will say, yeah, we're doing that. So let's, let's see if you really are. But then I think there's another component that oftentimes people miss is about building capacity. So building capacity, when I speak of it, is building capacity. If we wanna talk about Black Lives Matter, and that's what I think is that we should focus on when we talk about institutionalized racism and things that have um, sort of perpetuated the system that we've all learned to navigate in spite of, is that you need to build capacity with the individuals and the organizations and the communities that's being impacted. And so it's not good enough to just go in and build a building it, it, that's a start, but what happens if the, the builder happens to be of the community and of the color or the benefit is for them or the jobs? The jobs should be a part of a rebuilding of a, of a community or a neighborhood. And so, I, you know, it, it's certainly the, the heightened discussion. And now I guess I would just encourage people to be intentional and let's move to action. And the action that I'm talking about is so that we don't keep repeating the same thing again, because I'm old enough, as, as Roy would 
would yield to me to know that I've been in this conversation more than once. And I was born in the segregated South and I know that we've come a long way, but we still got a long way to go. And we can move, propel us forward if we're intentional and take action towards it. Beautifully said, beautifully said as always. Erica, I turn it to you for questions from our audience. So I, I'm going to start off with um, both Cassandra, Roy, and your um, organizations are getting a lot of love out there. We have a lot of comments on people just talking about how you truly are the backbone um, and assisting people in finding work. Uh, there are two kind of uh, themes that came up. One was, um, there was a couple questions related to, when you talk about digital skills or digital literacy, can you be a little more specific what that means for people that might need to expand that job skill set? Well, I, the, the first one is really basic. So our digital literacy one is they will teach you how to turn on a computer, how to get your emails, how to how to then do PowerPoint and and um, and Excel and do some spreadsheets. And every now and then we teach some economic development in there, you know, when, when they're doing something. So that's sort of basic. Then you have um, the sort of the next level that says, I know how to do all that. Don't, you know, don't demean me. But then um, let's, let's get a little more deeper into how it works and how you could then um, do some programming and how you could work. Now we do have sort of the software engineering and so it, we have multiple levels. And then for the youth, uh, we're looking at animation as a way to use sort of um, um, digital kinds of systems. Uh, and we're looking at STEM and then the Microsoft suite. So, and they get certificates to those. And then we, we contact that we work with the employers that actually their jobs at the end because we're not training you just for the skill, we're training you for the jobs that exist. So like in Salesforce or Centene or VSP or, or all the, the government agencies that will have jobs around that. So I would say at every level and no level is too low. And then I don't really think any level is that high uh, that we can't help you to, to get to where you need to go. Now, if I can piggyback, I agree with everything Cassandra said. I would add, you know, it's it's like uh, using tablets in our preschool classrooms and using um, uh, digital education devices in our K-6 and K-12 systems and incorporating, embedding that into instruction as well as, you know, we have a, a number of workforce activities. The, the other component, oh, and before I forget, I want to put a plug in for my friends over at Valley Vision who are, who are reconvening a digital literacy initiative. So if, if folks are interested in getting engaged, that, that's a great place to get engaged. But I, I, the, the other thing I should mention on, on digital literacy, which comes up repeatedly, and that's an access issue and not everyone has uh, equal access or broadband access or, or you know, internet access. And I think that's a, that's a more increasingly um, important component that COVID has, uh, has, has really pronounced, um, especially when you've got you know, three school age children plus, you know, two adults or one adult or however many, you got a bunch of demands on, so, you know, it's not, it's just changing, changing the home environment, changing the education environment. You know, all of our classroom trainers that, that, we, that we contract with, they're all doing remote instruction as well. So there's, um, you know, the number of Zoom accounts that are being sold out there. So all of that plays into this. So I think, um, to me, you know, it's it's digital, digital literacy is something that cuts across really everything, um, and including, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's it's really it's really almost like a necessary basic skill now. I mean, in, in addition to math, reading, communication, and you know the other soft skills that you need to be successful in a work environment, I think there's a minimum digital skills score that's really needed. We're not I'm not referring to like IT professionals. I'm just talking about people who, who need a minimum digital score to, to actually compete in, in the everyday workforce. So, and, and let me just add that the prerequisite is not huge. You just need to have the desire and the app to really want to learn it. So I think that's important for people to know as well. And, and uh, metrics uh, are free online training platform has lots and lots of both digital literacy and IT related coursework. 
Thank you for both that, Roy and Cassandra. And I think for any of us who have walked into what was our kind of local neighborhood restaurant or cafe, you know, one of the key things that have changed is just that that point of sale system. It's contactless, mm -hmm. it's digital. Previous to that, it might've been a cash transaction. And I think it's just one of a very small example of how we're seeing more of that in our, our work in our kind of work in our neighborhood environments. C Cassandra, to your point, and a question from Lynn, but well, before we close out here is, you made the comment about you, you just have to have a desire, not necessarily a specific educational. So, so Lynn's comment is, what level of education do I need to have achieved in order to participate in either of your programs? In most of our programs for the digital sort of IT, a high school diploma. And if you don't have a high school diploma, we have a partnership with a high school diploma program, a charter school that you can get it. So that desire, when we talk to employers and we call it screening in, we want to screen you in. And what it is, is you say, I want to do this and I want to do all that it takes to get there. And they and we will help you get there. Well, with that, Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you for some closing thoughts and share some resources on the screen for everybody. Great. Thank you so much. Again, to Cassandra and Roy, thank you for your time today. Thank you for being the stewards of this community that you are and all the work that you're doing. Um, you know, to that last question, I, you know, just reiterate as well, no barriers. There's no barriers, right? This, if you heard something today that you thought, maybe I should just check it out. You know, don't freak yourself out. It's as simple as going to the website, as simple as, you know, take that first step. These folks are here to help you and they will help you every step along the way. Uh, so for those that were listening today that want some more information on anything we talked about, you can go directly to seta.net or to sacramentoworks.org. You'll be able to find all of that information as well as that programming that Roy was talking about. Um, go ahead and get there. There are also all the phone numbers as well as anything that you heard from the robust umbrella of programming that the Urban League offers from youth to workforce development to our seniors to adults. Uh, you really, you know, you wrap around the community and you're just there for people in an incredible way. So everybody go there. A couple of quick reminders. Back to our, our Tuesdays at two last week, there is still time to get engaged in the Emerge Summit. Uh, so if that is a digital program, it'll be digital all day long on September the 17th. Maybe you could connect with Urban League or SETA and you could learn how to get on the computer so that you can engage in that program. But again, that's the, the largest young professionals conference this side of the Mississippi and you can engage uh, this year all online in a COVID safe environment, um, as well as always know that the Metro Chamber is there for you as well. So you could check us out at metrochamber.org, at rapidresponse.metrochamber.org, where we have a variety of COVID resources, as well as a phone number. You could call us at 833-391-1919. And we do have folks that can help you in English and Spanish. Uh, so please, you know, anything you heard today from thinking about getting new skills, getting your kids engaged in programming, uh, upscaling, if you're currently unemployed and you're just not sure what to do, reach out to any of those folks and they will guide you along the way. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to staying connected and we'll see y'all next Tuesday. Thank you.